Hello, everybody. I um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, welcome to the field trip to Valley Grant. Um, I'm trying to make sure everyone's muted. Um, so if you're not muted, please mute yourself. I tried to make sure everyone is. Um, I've had a request to me if I use my laser pointer to move it slowly, so I will do that. Um, the comments are on the screen there. Hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, so off we go. We're going to start at Valley Grant um, at the hall and we're going to finish at Valley Grant. So we start off with the geological map of Isla just to show you where we are. Um, this is we are here. Valley Grant is up here in the sort of uh, top right hand corner of Isla and the, what we're going to do is in this roughly in this red square here here. Um, we're in the Dalradian part of uh, the Precambrian succession of Scotland, um, in the sort of middle of the uh, top of the Apping group and the middle bottom of the Argyle group, looking at the area around what is marked in quite uh, uh, blue there as the, as the Lossett limestone and the Port Askeg Tillot formation. The Port Askeg Tillot, the Port Askeg formation, is coloured brown here. So we're going to be looking at this. Um, and in this area only. So we're not going to stray up here around the Port Askeg area or into this sort of a territory up here, which is slightly, some slightly different areas and that's a different topic. It would be too much to do all that today as well. So there's, there's more Port Askeg tillite in the north part of Isla. Uh, we're going to concentrate on this little wee section down here near the village of Bally Grant. So, we are talking about rocks that are around about 700 million years old in the sort of upper part or the late Precambrian or the Neo-Proterozoic. Um, so we're looking at rocks in and around this area here and we're pretty much gonna stay in that area of, of rock time. So we don't have to worry too much about jumping around the stratigraphic column. Pretty much everything we see today um, will be around about 700-ish million years old. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's have a look at an uh, aerial photograph of where we're going to do what we're going to do. Normally when I do this area with people, um, I do it in three walks. Uh, there's a walk from Bally Grant to go around Ben and, Dewey, ben and Bowie and back. There's a walk from here through Lossett to the coast, up to here and back. And there's another walk up from here that comes down to the coast here. The reason it's done in three bits is that there are some impassable bits, um, especially just here at Amial, there is a place we shall see. So we can just zoom around it today. So that's going to be quite handy. Um, and also because we can also jump out of uh, Ben and Bui across to here, we can jump that bit as well rather than having to double back. So we have about a 15 kilometer walk with a few uh, zoom jumps in it to walk down from Bally Grant down to the coast, overlook, having passed Ben and Bowie, round the coast, up the coast, and then sort of a nice sort of a three or four mile walk back. So in an hour and a half's time, you'll have done four, fifth, nearly 15 kilometers of walk. So I hope you'll be tired and deserve a drink at the end. Okay, this is a, a sort of geological sketch map that I've knocked up for the, uh, for the, the new book that I'm writing um, and this is this shows you the sort of geological um, key geological features of the area um, this is Bally Grant where we are now and um, this is the Bally Grant limestone in the and in the core of many one of the parts of the Isla anticline system there's a load of meta mudstones which aren't very well exposed uh, called the Mullock Dew and then the, the light blue here is the Lossett limestone which is pretty much the last limestone in the uh, in the Dalradian of this part of the world and that's, that's overlain by the Port Askeg formation which is in this sort of dirty brown color forms a shallow syncline running through here we carry on down to the coast and we cross a fault which we'll talk about later into the and there's a big outcrop of the Jura quartzite the Jura quartzite on the coast and we're going to follow it up to Amial. Um, this is all area owned by Dunlossett Estate and if you ever do go there on your own or with me um, go to the estate office or ring them and just check because they do quite a lot of shooting and they've not shot a geologist yet and they're very nice and very friendly but and they normally access is fine but uh, 
it is well worth checking because they do a lot of, it's not just deer shooting in the stalking season they shoot all sorts of uh, wee things and a lot of fishing as well so um, it is please do check with Dunlosset Estate before you go anywhere near this area. This is Bally Grant a bit of an old photograph uh, what it used to look like doesn't look like that anymore but these houses are still here this this all these buildings are still here. Bally Grant was actually Balia Grania which is the town of the grain so it was actually the, 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 uh, the center of a big grain growing area at the time uh, in the sort of medieval times and the fer land is fertile because a lot of limestone there now it's mainly cattle sheep but the, the grain is coming back because the distiller is like to have some barley so there's more grain coming back but it's actually became fam more famous in the middle ages and into the 17th 18th 19th centuries for lead mining and also there's a huge quarry there in the Valley Grant limestone so off we go on our walk this is a smiddy that belonged to the lead mine and we've just come out of the car park at the village hall and we're going to take this little road out into the wilds just a quick digression onto lead mining this is just near Valley Grant there's an engine house here there's a lump of galena. There was a smelter at As Port Askeg uh, in, the, in the 18th century. And from the mine, the lead mines at Bally Grant, where we are now, uh, one of the byproducts, in fact, what they really wanted actually was a lot of silver. And there's a lot of significant quantity of silver in the, in the Bally Grant lead. Not the other lead mines on Isla, but especially in the Bally Grant one. And this goblet has been made and it says it's in the uh, Kelvin Grove collection I believe I've yet to find it but it does say Isla Silver on it and we're going to we're starting here sorry we moved the pointer too quickly we're in the hall we're in the car park here we've just walked out and the quarry is to our set is to the south and here is our whole little map I've made of all the mine shafts in the uh, Valley Grant area and we'll have a quick look at some of those as we pass because we're walking up this road here and uh no, no geologist worth his salt would, would walk past a mine or a quarry without having to poke into it because that's what we do. So here's some uh, very overgrown and wet uh, quarry uh, mining uh, entrances. There's a new hydro mini run of the river hydro scheme that the estate have put in here. And they've also got a wood chip machine boiler up, up the, further up the valley. Um, there's, a, there's a shaft in behind it. These other shafts full of trees. Uh, they're all pretty flooded. Some lovely flowstone on the edge of this one where the water has dripped down, but this is wet. You can't get in very far. And this is the shaft of the silver mine at Gartnet, which is just behind the quarry. So Bally Grant Mines. Uh, this is the quarry. Some people have seen this picture before. This is a composite sort of a panorama of it. It's quite a big quarry in dark brown, dark gray, sorry, dark gray, sort of organic rich uh, meta limestone. Uh, not much structure in it, not much features in it. It's quite vertically bedded here, and this is pretty much in the core of the Isla Anticline, but it's fairly vertically. You can probably see some traces of the bedding here. It's not a very good pitch. It's slightly more angled this side, but it's, this, is a, this is a sort of panoramic view. So there are a lot of quarrying here of limestone for um, roadstone, mainly for roads, tracks, foundations of houses, foundations of distilleries. Um, yeah, this is the Mally Grant limestone. We walk up towards Loch Lossett, which is here, and this is a Loss distillery. The Kennels, which is this place now, which is now the home of the estate manager or the chief executive of Dunlossett, uh, David, lives there. This is what it used to look like. It's pretty much the same house, as you can see. And this was Lossett Distillery, uh, the Lost Distillery. So, uh, but, so some entrepreneurial people have got some Isla whiskey and rebottled it and called it Lossett. So, uh, but this was the distillery and we walked we walked round David's house um, which is now his house and we walk up towards Loch Lossett and we get to this little junction here and here's the junction with a nice little sign saying Loch Lossett we don't go that way that's the road that goes to the coast this is the way we're going to go uh, to Loch Lossett uh, lovely little lock the, the estate do some fishing on it um, and I've just shown the map again because that's where we are we've now we're, we're now leaving this track that goes to the coast remember we're at this junction here and we're now going to turn and go down here and we're going to look at a map in a bit more detail uh, shown by the red box and here's a detailed map of uh, there we are now at this junction here at the waterworks and we're going to walk down this track down the side of the lock then across then we're going to yomp across some country see a lead mine 
then we're going to have a good look at all these uh, wonderful exposures on the south side of Ben and Dewey, which is known as Ben and Dewey. Um, and we're going to look at some other uh, other exposures that aren't in uh, that I hadn't put in the guidebook, my guide, the draft of the guidebook, because they're difficult to get to because you have to cross over horrible fences. We'll look at those as we get there. This is Tony Spencer's map. I know Tony's on tonight, so thank you for sending this through to me. Uh, Tony's been working in this area for uh, 50 years, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> in a long time. And this is a composite map that he's been pulling together all those time. And we're looking at, we're in obviously this area here, and Tony's been mapping diamond types, mainly the the browns and yellows to the up here is the Port Askeg formation. And Tony's meticulously been mapping individual diamectite layers, um, quartzite layers um, in, the, in the Port Askeg formation uh, in this area here and, and in Ben and Bui. Uh, and it's a very meticulous, brilliant piece of uh, research. It's how geology should be done. A good example to us all. So here we are, just another picture before we get into some real rocks. This is looking across Loch Lossett to uh, Lossett Farm and Dunboriac, which has also got some exposures. That, uh, this is also the Port Askeg formation. Looking, we're looking northeast up the strike of the rocks. Um, then what happens here, we get on out, off the track and it suddenly becomes wild country. Yeah. We're uh, uh, in a sort of area of uh, heather, bracken, boggy bits. There's lots of pock marks here. This is because it's new tree planting. We've had to cross a new deer fence and there's a lot of new tree planting here. So in a few years time, there'll be trees growing here if the deer don't get in through the fences, but you can follow little uh, ATV tracks through here. And this area, this um, ridge here, it's a limestone ridge and it's the sort of lead mine. And then this is the area, this is Ben and Bowie. This is the area to the, to the, uh, to the south. Um, of the uh, of the lead mine where we're going to be looking at the Port Askeg formation. So let's have a look at the lead mine first. Um, this was known as Little Glasgow, Glasgowberg, um, and it has some pits and trenches, um, some bit of spo spoiling, spoil heaps, some adits, and it was quite an extensive area of lead mining, you can see here. Um, this is where we are now. We've just crossed it. We've come across, Loch Lossett is at the top of the map here, top of the photograph, and we're just in these trenches here, but it does extend further south. What's interesting is that all the drainage for these area and all these mines drained through this little burn that went down into the loch. And um, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to this. Sorry, this side's out of, shape, out of position. This is a rock that I found at the lead mine. This is a, a lump of, uh, of limestone, at the thing, and it's got these uh, gashes in it which seem to stop at this sandstone. So it's the first real rocks we've seen. And um, I'm intrigued as to why these gashes stop and poke out into this more sandy layer here. Um, so I'm hoping someone like Ian, maybe Ian Fairchild's on, he might explain it whether this is whether this is molar truth structure or whether there's um, something happening into the rheology of these rocks where these sands aren't picking up these tension cracks because there's a later fracturing system through here which is related to the mineralization. So this is 600 million, 700 million year old limestones uh, with these cracks here which are probably probably Carboniferous age, 300 million years carrying the lead, the lead not just in this sample, but there's probably minor spots of galena in here. But then I want to know why these uh, these cracks stop here or poke into the sand. So maybe we can, someone can come on to me later and ex help explain this. I'll just finish the sort of a uh, story of the history of the lead mining. The bottom graph is from estimates of the historical record of when lead, the amount of tonnage of lead that was which was retrieved from Isla over the years. Yeah, so the years on the bottom. This is lead uh, tonnage per year, very estimated because it's very difficult to get good records, but that seems to be the pattern. And the first references in the historical record are back to about the, uh, oops, someone's chatting to me. Let's see what they're saying. Oh, it's Ian, hasn't said anything. Wakely's finished speak. Right, I'll go back to Ian when he's, uh, when he's finished typing his, uh, his message. Um, so this historical record, and uh, about tw tw 15 years ago, a guy at Edinburgh did a big archaeological, uh, big survey of the lo lake sed the lock sediments 
to try and work out uh, the ages of the sediment and their mineral anomalies and date them. And the idea was to see whether there was any truth in the rumor that, that the Vikings had mined lead on Isla. And these are the type, these are the periods in the various locks he sampled. And Loch Lossett, which drains Glasgow Berg, has infant has definitely a co uh, copper, sorry, uh, a lead anomaly well before any historical records, around about the sort of late 14th century. So uh, interesting sort of history and geological and archaeological sort of uh, investigation. I can talk more about this, but I just wanted to make, just to show you that this was the sorts of things that are going on, that can be done to try and understand a bit more about the history of these, these areas using geology uh, and, in an integrated way. Uh, let me just see what Ian said. Has Ian said anything about this? Uh, Ian can explain the gashes. Do you want to speak, Ian? You can unmute yourself. I think we leave all that stuff to the end, David. Okay, we'll come back to the slide at the end. Yeah, okay, that's fine. All okay. right. Okay, so we're uh, now walking through, we've passed the lead mine and we're walking towards Ben and Boo and I want to show you two, two outcrops that you would not normally get to because there's fences and all sorts of difficulty getting there, but there's some, what's called a molar tooth outcrop, an outcrop of molar tooth limestone or limestone with molar tooth structures in it and a weird breccia. I wanted to just pass, as we're now on a walk, we, we have to pass these things. We don't go back to them because we don't do that sort of thing as we're geologists, we, we walk. Um, you can see here that the, 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 the land here is quite green and fertile and well grazed. This is all limestone in here and uh, this isn't limestone. This is, a, this is actually a, big, an outcrop, a, a, a small outcrop of breccia, not a very good outcrop, but there is, you can see big lumps of stuff in here. And all the, this seems to be in the Lossett limestone. This is an area, and we'll discuss this a bit later, but there seems to be cross isla sort of pockets or little patches of, of uh, breccia within the Lossett limestone, which is quite unusual. Normally it's a quite, well, you'll see more of the Lossett limestone as we go on, but we've passed this breccia. I wouldn't want to not just quickly mention it in passing. And we'll come back to how this all fits in later, or maybe. This is on the hill, the limestone hill to the south of Ben and Bui, um, where we're sampling here. And this is what, would, what Ian would describe as molar tooth structure. Is Ian Fairchild in the meeting? Is he on the trip? I don't know if he's there or not. Possibly not. The, 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 I was hoping Ian would explain some of these structures. The point is that they're, they're, they're unusual and restricted to the sort of late Precambrian um, and usually, usually occur um, in rocks that are pre the Sturtian snowball, pre the Sturtian glaciation, uh, and not don't are not usually found elsewhere uh, in the succession. They're weird sort of crack fills in muddy limestones. Um, sometimes have a sort of political pattern when you look down on it. When you see in cross section, it's all over the place, and it's sort of um, the, the the idea was that it looks a bit like the sort of top surface of a molar tooth, uh, sort of broken, crinkled sort of surface. Um, Unusual things, and what's also unusual is that they've got a strontium isotope profile that's that's also matches. This is quite low in terms of strontium. Um, I'm not going to go into strontium isotopes and what they are and how they get there, but nevertheless, it's the absolute value of it that's important. And the strontium isotopes in this section are around about 0 0.7064, which is very typical of pre-Sturtian. Uh, limestone sequences. So an area, you know, this gives us a little bit of a handle given there's no fossils, nothing else to date the thing, that it, that it, that it also it starts to tell us where we are in the stratigraphy. So we're standing, just moved a bit north and the reason why we've gone, we've had to, we've had to go, we're going to the Ben and Bowie across here and why we haven't gone to the molar tooth structure normally is a 30 great electric barbed wire fence you have to cross, which we're not going to cross. We don't, don't do that. So normally if you come to the molar tooth structure, you've got to double right back to here and then follow, come here. But we've just, we could just zoom across here and we can look at some outcrops of the Lossett limestone uh, um, at succession here, two and three. And then we can look at the Port Askeg formation at the crest of Ben and Bowie here. So we're looking north at this sort of, uh, and looking at the crest of the hill over here. So let's cross the bog and, and uh, the, uh, the fence and get to number two which is not the, it's Lossett limestone formation, but just shows you that it's not all limestone. There's quite a lot of uh, 
uh, meta sandstone quartzites and meta mudstones with the cleavage in here. We can see bedding going like this, obviously beds of sand and mud. And this mud is carrying a, a sort of quite a low angle sort of cleavage. So this is fairly typical of parts of the Losset limestone section where you've got these beds of quartzite and, and, and meta, meta mudstone. Sometimes we get some soft sediment deformation features. Some of you have been here with me and seen this one here. This looks like a vertical sand injection feature, possibly leading into sort of a, maybe it, maybe it actually produced a mud volcano or some sort of feature on the, 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 the sediment water interface here. But it looks like this sand unit here has pinched and pinched out, pinched, and it's been injected also. Or maybe it's come up from, or maybe it's catchy, joined in with one from here as well. It looks like that's, it looks like that bed has gone all the way up to here and possibly across to here. So it's a small scale thing, but it just shows you that you are even in an area where you've had uh, metamorphism, where we believe that this is, this, you saw that was a cleavage there, a metamorphic uh, foliation. You've got, we know that we're in the chlorite biotite zone, green schist fasces. So we've been down 20 odd kilometers, yet we're still preserving sedimentary features. And as you've got the section here, you'll see more and more and more of, um, Let's see if someone else is chatting. Let's just see what they want to say. Okay, so Matthew's seen this uh, north of Keels when he was mapping. Matthew's uh, a student at the university and he's been a bit of an Isla file. He's uh, been doing his undergraduate mapping on Isla and he's obviously seen some of these. So thanks, Matthew, for that. If we, uh, any more contributions, thank you very much. Brilliant. So this is, uh, yeah, a sort of soft sediment feature, which has been preserved despite the metamorphism. So the metamorphism is quite low grade, really, uh, but especially so here in this whole Ben and Bowie section, when you get further up the section, you wouldn't think there's any metamorphism at all. So this is true Losset limestone, what you see here. This is, this is just a quite a thick bed of sort of brownish gray, coarsely bedded sort of crudely bedded limestone with not much features in it. And this is fairly typical of these, uh, these limestones in this area. Uh, occasionally you find nice features. This is uh, almost certainly a, some sort of bihermal dome, a stromatolithic dome. It has a, a, a sort of lamination running through this. It looks like there's sediments over the top of it. Um, it's almost certainly uh, some, and there are stromatolites within the Losset limestone section. Uh, and, and people do argue that this is indication uh, that the, that what we are looking at is uh, fairly warm water limestones. Now there's a debate about that, but nevertheless, the idea is that you're seeing generally sort of warmer water conditions in these limestones, and then above us we're going to get a glacial section, so we're going to see a, a climate change. On the top of the hill, just before we get to the uh, the, the uh, for, to, tillite formations. Uh, here's the limestone exposed on the top, quite karstic here. Where I don't know what age the karst, probably per, uh, periglacial. Uh, it's been certainly uh, uh, exposed and, and karstified uh, quite dramatically on the tops of these hills where it's been exposed to the wind and the weather. And from here, from this position, we're actually just standing here where that karst is up here. We'll look across this escarpment to see the basically the base of the Port Askeg formation, which I've marked as a sort of yellow... Uh, a yellow line here on the map and I'm, st I'm standing on the geological map. Some of you may have printed it off. I'm standing at sort of roughly about X. There's the, this is locality for the cast limestone here. So I'm just stood back a bit here and looking at, across at what I would going to call uh, I, um, locality six. Now it's a bit odd here because I would normally take people here when we're walking, we'd nip and cross, look at number five first before we get to six obviously but i'm going to miss out five and come back to it because it is out of sequence and i'd rather show you in sequence so because we're zooming about um i can uh, i can do that so i'm going to go from four where we are now i'm going to look at the whole of six and i've divided it into sort of five sections a b c d e right and then we're going to look at seven after six then I'm going to quickly zoom back to five just to get it because that's the way the stratigraphy works. It's just that the because there's a few faults here, um, it just makes life a bit easier in terms of trying to comprehend what is quite a complicated stratigraphy. So here we are at locality six. Um, and I've sent this to some folk and I've this is a sort of diagrammatic representation of what we're going to be seeing um, in the base of the Port Askeg formation. I've divided it up 
this these complicated stratigraphy into sort of units now nobody else has recognized these units this is me just being a very informal um units uh from just to help me explain it to people when they go and visit there so we're going to refer back to this and look at these different units and different lithologies um in the base of the Pataske formation through unit through number one to number five before we and these are some strange lithologies before we get to the true Port Aske uh, diamictite section, which people have quite many of you were fairly familiar with seeing pictures of. But this is an unusual unit at the bottom of the formation. It's not very thick. We're talking only 10, maybe 10, 20 meters uh, uh, of it, but it's a very unusual succession. And it's, this is why we're here to have a look at this and see what's going on. So we cross to number 6A, across the Glen, little uh, valley there, and we see the top of the Lossett limestone. This is quite a sort of whitish sort of dolomitic limestone here. And then we see on top of it a brown sandstone. Yeah, and there is quite a lot of uh, lumps of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the limestone here. And it's quite an uneven surface. You can see it's up here and it goes up here and up here. And I think the next slide is an enlargement of that. Yes, this is, I'm going to just focus in on that little red square. You can see it a bit more detail here. You can see here I've got, you saw that down at the bottom here is sort of lime, is the like bedded lime, but the top of it is quite brecciated into big chunks. And then you've got this brown sandstone and some clasts here. And this sort of probably the brown sandstone is sort of filtering around the clasts in here. Um, so a sort of a strange sort of uh, um, juxtaposition of rocks. Move further along, um, this is towards B, and we see the, the breccia up here, the brown sandstone here. This is the limestone or the dolomitic limestone and some uh, meta mudstones and meta sandstones just below it. So we've got, uh, this is the Lossett formation, then we've got this breccia unit and then the, the red sandstone unit. Um, go a bit further along, we see a stromatolite, almost certainly is a stromatolite in the Lossett limestone. And then quite a lot of this breccia uh, with the sort of red sandstone sort of smeared all over the place. And I think that a lot of these are crack fills that are just sort of standing out with the weathering because they, these dolomitic sandstones don't weather as much as the limestone. So you actually get these standing proud, uh, these, these things, so they, because the sand is filtered into, it looks like the sand is filtered into a, uh, a whole pile of bits of the, of the, of the limestone. Someone's chatting, what they were saying. Okay, someone's having to leave to acquire, but we'll look out for the recording. Yes, I am recording this, so I will put it on YouTube. And uh, so, yes, hopefully you'll be able to sort of see it later. Let's move on a bit further around the corner here. Um, and if you're around the corner, you can see here's the, the sort of bedded limestone here. Here's the breccia stuff. And if you look here, you see these sort of, uh, these sort of, uh, what's almost certainly a crack fill or a, sometimes called a Neptunian dike where the, the sand has gone down some sort of crack you can see it here as well where it may be filtering down into the breccia so this has been some people have termed this a regolith which is maybe a breccia that was lying on the surface of a maybe a karstic surface and it, then there's a lot of breccia rubble lying around and then a sand comes on top of it uh, and sort of filters its way down into all the cracks that are there um, so a quite unusual sort of unconformity, as it were, but with sort of two, two stages to it, a sort of breccia sitting on a, a, a karstic, maybe uneven surface with lumps and lumps of dolom dolomitic limestone all over the place, and then a sand comes in and drowns the topography. Um, here's an, another good example of it. This is probably a crack fill in here as well. So this is, this is, so walking this section, you see these different examples of this unconformity. It was used in the, in the early mapping of Ireland to show that this was the right way up. This was not upside down. There's no way you could get this type of geology if, if, unless this was the right way up. Again, notice there's not a lot of metamorphism here. Whereas, you know, there's, the, these rocks have not changed much uh, in, in all the 700 million years since they were deposited. Um, above the red brown sandstone, we get to this unit here, which is I call unit two. Those of you who are following on my stratigraphy. Um, and then unit three, which is a sort of rippled sandstone. So we'll have a quick look at unit two, which is this sort of uh, uh, sort of more gray gray unit. When you look at it in detail, it's got a lot of fine lamination in it, and then it's got some carbonate rock 
fragments in it. This is carbonate, and it's weathered out a bit more than this is a. This is actually a a, a grey sort of uh, siltstone, um, and it's quite possible that these are these are valves or laminations within the siltstone, and this is a dropstone. So it's giving us some indication, if this is true, that, we, that there's something going on that's ice related. What we've seen before. You could happen uh, you could have in all sorts of climates and environments you have a, a karstic topography with a regolith and a sand dumped on top of it who knows it could be fluvial, but probably is fluvial, but uh, river deposits but doesn't tell you anything about climate particularly um but this is this is telling you something this is a, this is a this is a sort of quiet sort of lake maybe an ice dam lake that's got seasonal uh seasonal deposits and then the, in the winter, it gets covered in ice, and then the ice melts and drops the, the its load, the bed load into into the bottom of the mud and forms these little drop stones. And you can see other ones as well. This is another one here, and these, you can see these fine fine laminations throughout this. Uh, it's only about a meter thick, um, but it's a very interesting deposit and you, uh, very sort of uh, almost unequivocal drop stones. I don't think anyone's particularly arguing. This is the this is the unit three. Uh, Ripple bedded sandstone, also probably fluvial of some sort. Maybe another river uh, brought this in. Uh, so maybe you've got some inter so rivers, lakes, a bit of ice going on. Some so these probably are possibly meltwater rivers uh, bringing more sand into the area. So there's there's unit two, and unit three, and we get a hint of unit four over here, which is sort of some interbedded sort of orangey and and uh, bluey gray things but we're going to go around the corner to see them in a much better exposure so just a hint of number four coming up so we go around the corner we've just looked at six we've been all the way along six looking at all those bits and pieces of six and we've just crossed a, a fault and a dike and this little up faulted block here just get, brings a bit more of the stratigraphy so the units we believe that the last limestone units one two three are underneath here another one somebody else wanted to say something uh, someone said, is it low metamorphic grade or dry metamorphism? I, I suspect both. Uh, Alistair, I know Alistair's on, he might uh, say that, but it is low grade and maybe this whole block just didn't get a lot of water through it. I'm not sure. Alistair, are you there? Do you want to say anything about metamorphic grade and why it doesn't, why there's not much metamorphism? metamorphism? I know Alistair's. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, uh... Welcome, Alistair. Hi Dave, great talk. I'm loving it. Um, it's uh, the the Great Anila is biotite, and uh, but large areas of the island have been unaffected by metamorphism because they're fairly impermeable rocks, and the carbonates are pretty impermeable, so that lots and lots of things have been preserved, particularly in the carbonates. And then you've got most of the what most of the fluid that does the metamorphism is funneled through the fold hinge. Um, and all you need to be is a hundred meters away from it, and it's fairly dry. Yeah. So yeah. So in some yeah. So Alistair's saying that basically the, the metamorphic flow, you need metamorphic fluids to get metamorphism, and where in, in it's channeled and focused down fold axes and faults, and where you've got sort of areas in between, especially with impermeable lithologies, not a lot happens. Good stuff. Okay. Let's have a look at this. Is this is known locally? throughout this part of the world as the disrupted beds because they're quite uh, unevenly bedded so if i look a bit more so let's just uh, home in on a bit of these things here so we see these sort of blue gray uh, this is these are silt stones that are quite high in magnetite and um, hematite so they're about 30 percent detrital iron minerals in them then you get these sort of beds of the beds of dolomitic sand, dolomite or dolomitic siltstone that are, that come and go with this sort of wavy bedding, and this was the, one of the reasons why they were known as disrupted beds. And 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 you'll see when I there are other examples on the Garvelix where they're much more disrupted. Um, you do see a gradation here. This is a meta. This is the the iron siltstone grading up into a coarsening up into a sort of sand with sort of clasts, and there's some there's some sort of dolomitic breaches here with clasts in here. Um, the current thinking is that these dolomitic bands within the meta siltstone, between the, in the magnetic, the magnetic, they are magnetic. They do fl flick a compass if you get the right bit. Uh, are concretions. These are concretion dolomites. Um, not they weren't deposited as individual beds at the time. They, they sort of grew as concretions. In, in uh, and I know Ian has done a lot of work on these. Someone else is chatting. 
Oh, someone just says thanks. Right, fine, thank you. Um, okay, so this this is this is a key part of the disrupted beds. Oh, more chat. Someone's talked about that is the magnetic. Yeah, we do think this is detrital. We think this is derived. Um, Someone's asked about are they marble? Um, not really. No, they're sort of still they're meta limestone, but they're not marble in the sense that uh, you and I would see a marble like the Ona marble or the Connemara marble. They're nothing like that at all. They are just uh, you can still see the original the original rock chemistry in it. To try to we think this may be derived from an earlier an, other ironstone, so that this is about twenty to thirty percent iron, and it looks like it's derived from maybe something that was that was more iron rich. So this may be. Uh, erosion products of an iron some iron deposit upstream if it was up on a river or a lake or a shallow marine setting but it's been derived from somewhere we're not sure where more questions lots of questions oh right <laughs> just some of bob saying thanks understood right great let's just go to the left a bit here and we see uh here's some of the the sort of silt stony bits and and above here some uh some nice sort of uh sandy breaches dolomitic sandy breaches without um yeah so really lovely rocks uh, i know alistair's team are looking at some of these silt stones to see if there's a uh, monazite in it which is a phosphate mineral with iron with uranium in it bits of uranium in it and it may be possible may be possible to use those to do some dating and i think um that's that works in hand so it'll be good to know how that pans out because uh, um Okay, so Patrick's doing the work. Patrick's just on. He says there is monazite, but he's going to date xenotime, which is, I think, a, a, a product of a, a decay product of. Anyway, maybe, maybe Patrick, you'll tell me what xenotime is. Are you there, Patrick? No, come back to come back and chat. Put something on chat about what what uh what xenotime is. I'd be interested. In, I've heard the word, but I'm not sure what it is. So. Um, um, so monazite is the mineral that's, the, 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 you know, so there is some mineralogy in here that may be to give us a bit more of a clue about dating. Because as, you, as I've alluded to, getting an absolute date from these rocks is quite, uh, is quite difficult. And it would be very interesting to be able to date, absolutely date these rocks rather than just by correlation and, uh, and other sort of uh, indirect evidence. Okay, we've now just, so I was at seven and I said I was going to hop back to five. So I have hopped back to five because these are the beds that overlie the, 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 the so-called disrupted beds. In fact, there's a, this is just in this very steep cliff, which is not easy to get to. And I wouldn't recommend, but I, Alistair and I and, and Tony, we've scrambled down this and, and hunted around in here. And there's, there's, the, there's the sort of blue siltstones here. And this unit sits above it. And it's a big, thick sort of concrete, almost, almost entirely concretionary dolomite. It's about th three or four meters thick, maybe a bit more. Um, this, uh, just on the top of the hill here, we find quite a lot more of it. So these are beds of concretionary dolomite um, sitting above the disrupted beds. So this is what I call unit five. And sometimes you get near the top, you get some breaches. Um, so you can see beautiful breaches in here. These maybe, maybe there's been some water flow here as well. Maybe there's a slight hint of imbrication in this as well so th th maybe there's a current flow uh, some sort of uh, water has helped has formed the, some of these breaches and at the top of this there's a dolomitic breccia at the top there's a very pronounced sandstone bed which is quite mappable and followable and in fact in Dunboriac to the north uh, we find several a couple of repeats of this bed uh, I mean, maybe the, maybe it thickens a bit to the west, and there may be more of these dolomitic breaches and this sand. But this is quite a prominent, mappable feature. Um, this is Ian, the late uh, Ken Chu, and Tony sitting and uh, all examining this uh, this lovely piece of rock. So there we are. There's the there's the photography. You've seen this karstic topography infilled with the Neptunian dikes. Uh, this meta silt stone with the valves and the drop stones, a laminated sandstone. Oh, someone else, someone else, someone else is chatting. Zener time, YPO4. Okay. Okay, so it's a phosphate min phosphate type mineral. Right, bye. <laughs> Patrick Casey has written something. Everyone can read that. I'm not going to read it out. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll look at that later. Thank you. 
Um, then we've got the disrupted beds, uh, some breccias, the bedded concretionary dolomites, uh, sandstone at the top. Well, I missed the breccia out. It was a, this is an older version of the map of the diagram. The bre there should be breccia in there. I put it in there later. And then we get diamic types on top of it. So the, they are they're just a summary of the one, two, three, four, and five. Just thought I'd just, just to summarize where, you, where we're at. Um, and then if we go uh, over to here, to number nine, just jump over here, we find some of the first diamictites. There's actually a quartzite here, some diamic, poorly exposed diamictites in here, a thick quartzite unit, maybe. Okay, I'm going to answer. I'm going to pick up some of these. I'm going to park some of these questions, and we'll look at that when we get to the end of the uh, at the end of the outcrop. We'll just park some of these questions people are asking. So I want to just finish this wee bit, and then we'll have a have a chat. Um, so there's a quartzite here, and then there's some diamictites in here. Um, so here's some diamictites. These are the these are what you the kind of things you you often see in the Port Askeg in here. We're quite low down in the Port Aske diamictite succession and virtually all the classes are carbonate. Um, these are and often form pockets where they've been eroded out. Yeah, so this whole thing is a like pockmarked uh, outcrop um, with sort of mainly carbonate stones. And you can see here, we've got a, 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 a set, perhaps some sort of sedimentary lamination like bedding, just very, very faint. But this has got quite a marked sort of a metamorphic cleavage in it here because there's obviously some mud in these tillite, these, these uh, tillite type deposits, dimic type deposits. So a difference between the bedding and the cleavage, and we'll return to that theme a bit later on as well. Further around, um, we found some, this are some pebbles of quartzite. Uh, again, you can see the pockets of the eroded out uh, carbonates on this pot mark. Uh, so, but but, the, but the, these quartzites stand proud because they're obviously not weathering out. They're standing proud. Oops, I thought I'd already summarized it. There's a better one. I've got my breccia in at the top of the below the sandstone at the top. Um, I think I was going to try and put some in deposition environments on it, but I'm, I'm a bit scared of deposition environments in this area because everybody has a different opinion on it. I, I've talked with Roger here and we think sort of fluvatile, lacustrine fluvatile, shallow marine. I'm not sure how the concretions, where, what sort of environment you form these concretion and dolomites, and then you get into a sort of uh, true sort of glacial deposits. And then this is very typical of the Port Aske where you get cyclicity of a, of a diamictite with a quartzite. And this is maybe the, this is formed during the melting phase of the, of the glacial progradation. And then there's a quartzite formed uh, when the sea level rises and reworks some of the, some of the things. So um, yeah, something's going on. Uh, there's obviously some sort of hint of, uh, hint of, hint of glacial stuff going on here and then true glacial deposits at the top. And some of these breaches and, and diamictites in here obviously seem to be glacial as well. Compare it with the Garvelix just very quickly. I know Tony will probably uh, have an apoplexy here, but uh, some of the great breach here on the Garvelix looks pretty similar to our, my unit one. Some of these dolomites can look quite similar to what we see in here. Disrupted beds, this is why they call the disrupted beds. They are quite disrupted. They have a lot more of these magnetic, uh, sorry, these uh, silt, blue gray siltstones with these sort of concretionary dolomite horizons in them. So, so uh, and it's much thicker. And that's overlain by a thing called the upper dolomite, which looks a bit like the dolomite we were looking at at the top of our section here. So there's some sort of lithological similarities, but, but obviously a lot of differences as well. I'm not trying to make uh, uh, any sort of real correlation. I just want to say there are some similarities in some of the rock times. And this is a wee diagram I've sort of knocked up based on some of the work that Tony's been doing. And we're here at Ben and Bowie, and that's pretty much what we see. Lossett limestone, I've colored it orange in this sort of breccia unit that we're looking at, um, some dolomites that we've just seen, and then we're into um, diamictites. We're going to go and look at this section here next on the coast. Um, and this is the section in North Isla, which we're not going to see today. Um, that's the other, that's the bit to the north of Port Askeg, which has got quite a lot of thick succession and some strange rocks at the bottom. And then the Garvelix, we're down here. Um, and there's, in the Garvelix, what's interesting is that there is a section in Garvelix that isn't at Ben and Bowie. Yeah, 
we've got section of uh, the upper part of the Losset Formation or the, upper, the Garvelic, now called the Garvelic Formation, pinches out somewhere between Isla and the Garvelics and doesn't, ha doesn't occur. Um, so it may, be, it may have been here and been eroded. Uh, Tony has meticulously mapped and described well over 40 individual uh, diamictites over the years, and they're all numbered from D1 to right up to D, I think when I put that star there, there's, there's a D45 and a D46 now. So um, quite a succession of diamictites and quartzites in the, in the Port Askeg formation. But here at Ben and Bowie, we don't see D1 to 12. And, and if the great breccia on the Arvelix is roughly correlatable with the breccias we, we see here, then we've got an unconformity surface here. We've got missing section both above and below this unconformity. Yeah, can you see that? We've got missing, missing Garvelic formation and missing D1 to 12. And the, those rocks I showed you the wee pictures of is much thicker over here on the Garvelics, which is why this is the sort of type section, certainly for the lower part of the Port Askeg formation, because it's complete and it hasn't possibly, almost certainly hasn't got any erosion unconformity. It's a straight succession through here. And that's why it's a candidate for, a, for the base of the cryogenian section. If we had a beautiful, if we had some age dating, it would be a really good candidate, but we need some age dating just to tie it all in. But anyway, uh, Garvelix is another, sub, another subject altogether. I'm not going, I've been there once with Tony. I'm not going to dwell too much more on it, but that's just give you a summary of where we're at with the stratigraphy in the, in the lower part of the Port Askeg formation. Just wanted to quickly show the isotope work. This is a, uh, Carbon isotopes. I'm not going to go into the reasons why they're doing this, but this is this is the Bally Grant formation, the Lossett formation. We see a gradual, gradual uh, uh, change in delta in, in carbon 13, uh, in the, in, and this is where we are now. We're looking at in the Lossett limestone just below the Port Asker formation at Lock Lossett. We're seeing values here. In the Garvelix, we see this. Yeah, a sort of rise and a fall before we get into the Port Askeg formation itself. This is the bit that's missing in Isla. So we see the cryogenian, the, the ice, the, the diamectite sitting on this bit of the geology here. And this bit in Isla is missing. This used to be called the Isla anomaly, but it's now been rechristened the Garvelix anomaly because that's where it is. This is a carbon... Uh, isotope excursion it's called um, and it's been it's in the literature you'll read about it as the Isla anomaly but it should be the Garvelix anomaly and this is correlatable pretty much around the world in many places and in places where there is datable rock we think that this is actually predates the cryogenian the base of the cryogenian the Sturtian glaciation which we believe we're in um, dated around I think the latest dating from China is around about 717 and the peak of the uh, either anomaly or the Garvelix anomaly um, is around about 735. So there's a, there's a sort of increase in delta and then a decrease again here. So uh, this, this all tells us something, and then this is the bit where those strontium isotopes were that tell us we're pre sturtian So it all seems to tie together, but we could just do with some absolute ages on Isla or the Garvelix to try and make sure all this fits in, that what we are anticipating has happened is actually, uh, is actually real. Just a minor digression, this is a map I've just pulled together to show what Rodinia might have been like at the time. So here we are, this is Scotland, just south of the equator on the edges of Laurentia. And this, these are other areas around the world where there is uh, uh, glacial deposits of this age. Yeah, so it, pretty much on every continent, um, uh, Amazonia, Baltica, um, West Antarctica, Congo, all these kratons um, all have and South and North Australia all have um, uh, sturdy and age, 720 year old, million, million old uh, glacial deposits. And the flip is the Franklin Large Igneous Province, which may be that in conjunction with the fact that we had a mid-latitudinal uh, continent, supercontinent surrounded by oceans and sitting in mid-latitudes together may have been some of the, uh, the kickoff of, of Snowball Earth. You get massive chemical weathering of these basalts and uh, and you know and the major change in in ocean uh, major change in atmosphere uh, carbon dioxide concentrations and, and cooling. Not going to go too much into that wasn't the point of the day, but I did want to just throw that picture up for you. So we're pretty much going to leave Ben and Bowie. Um, I tell you, um, we're going to then we're going to go down to the coast. We're going to jump across 
to the track, goes down to the coast and follow up the coast on the sound of uh, the sound of Isla. Let's check the time. Um, so here we are, we've just finished here. We're gonna just jump across to here and knit down this track, hit the coast and go up here. So we'll just do that now. First rocks we see are some of these, again, some of these meta sandstones and meta silt stones, uh, meta mud stones. Again, quite a lot of cleavage in it. Um, so we are, when there's fluids um, and you get meta mudstone, you will get some metamorphic uh, geology. Um, and these are these are part of the Lossett formation. And then we're gonna follow this track. Here we are following this track. Now you can see here, looking at the Google Earth, or this is actually GPS, um, that this is limestone and these green fields with these ridges in it are limestone. This is the Port Aska formation, the tillites in this sort of scruffy area of, of forest, of scrub and stuff. And this is the Jura quartzite, again, with no good soil on it. So the geology you can pick out quite nicely. And this is a fault here, quite sharply defined on the, on the, on the, on the map that goes between the Jura quartzite and these limestones. And you can see here that this is the, this is the fault here this way and the strike of the limestones you can see quite nicely if you would map it making a map you, you would put your strike of your limestone beds in this sort of orientation quite obviously but the Port Askeg formation base of it runs through here at a different angle and intersects the coast here so this limestone on a map sort of has a bit sort of triangular outcrop pattern which is quite unusual and difficult to explain and when you look up the hill from halfway down the track you can see the quartzite uh, heather, heathery quartzite hills of the Jura quartzite and the brown, and the nice green hills of the uh, of the Lossett limestone and you can walk this this little stream comes up in here and it looks like there's a fault here and if I was a mapping geologist I would map that as a sort of as a, as a as a boundary that's probably dipping quite steeply in this way it must do that to get that to go around that topography it must be dipping the contact whatever the contact is but if this is if this is Lossett limestone which it is and this is Jura quartzite um, that's much younger than that and there's a and there's a fault through here because this isn't this isn't stratigraphically on top of that this is way below this 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 is stratigraphically below that yeah, that's Jura Quartzite, which sits way above the Lossett limestone. There's a Port Askig Tillite and a Bonnerhaven Dolomite section. There's a thousand, maybe a thousand meters of section missing at this point. Yeah, so this faults. So nearby at the fault, we get the limestone. In places near the fault, it's quite folded. This is quite steep folding in the in in the uh, in the Lossett limestone. We don't see that at Ben. We see some, don't see much of that at Ben and Bowie, but further nearer the fault, you get a bit more deformation. Then you come onto the coast and at Tribarn, where the uh, power line to Collinsey from Collinsey uh, from, from Jura comes in, here's the Jura quartzite. It's actually flat here. Uh, it's almost horizontal, which will be a contrast to what we're going to see further up the coast. So you get up, you get down to the coast, and it's a lovely walk on the little pebble beaches all the way up the coast up to here. So we're going to do a nice trundle along the coast. And the, one of the first things we see, one of the things we see as we come around here, is a one thing that isn't 600 million years old, this is 60 million years old. This is a tertiary uh, or Cenozoic dike of uh, dolerite um, here and over here. And when you look at it and walk around it, you realize that this is actually offset. This bit of the dike joins up with this bit over here, and there's about a 30 meter offset along a fault which runs up the sound. So this is showing again another example of someone I've, who went to Jura with me uh, will see I've seen that on Jura where these dikes are offset by by quite late stage, later than 60 million year old faults, strike slip faults. And there is a whole set of strike slip faults up the sound of Isla, but that's a topic for another day. As we come around the coast, um, we come across some weird rocks. We suddenly find some carbonates. These, are, these, are, these brown rocks are sort of dolomitic um, limestones. And then in the background there is a place called a little headland called Stack Liath, which is the grey stack, which is Jura Quartzite. So we're on Jura Quartzite. We've then you found some carbonates, and then we've got Jura Quartzite again. And the uh, this this is the this is the carbonate section in here, and there's the Jura Quartzite. Um, and there's actually another fault this side as well. So and then another fault the other side. So there's actually several vertical faults and a lot of vertical beds and meshed up beds. So this, this is the sort of fault zone that, that occurs between 
the Lossett limestone section and the Jura quartz I showed you going up the hillside. But this is where it intersects the coast, and you can have a good look at the sort of structures that are going on. This is the lime, This is the Jura quartz site. You can see it's not horizontal here. It's quite steep. Um, it's got this is bedding. There is actually not it's not cleavage. This is bedding in a quartz site. There's a nice bit bedding in it. Just a pretty shot looking north before I get into the geology. This is the where we're going to be going. Uh, the next section is this section here, uh, the, where the Port Askeg formation uh, outcrops Jura in the background there. But if you look at the detail in the foreground, after the quartzite stack, you get more carbonates and quite deformed carbonates. And the, the Jura quartzite, this ridge going out is from the stack going north. This little rib going out here is limestone, and then we've got Port Askeg formation here. So there's several faults uh, sort of trundling into this area. Just want to quickly show you some geological maps, contrasting geological maps, um, and just have an explanation of what this fault is all about. This is the map, the, the survey map from 1907, and it shows this fault doing this. And then there's a bit of, they're not quite sure what earth's going on here, but this is this little triangular area of limestone. The, the red dotty stuff is the Port Askeg formation. This is the blue limestone, and this is the Jura quartzite. This is how they interpreted it in 1907. Jump across to the, the sort of current version of the BGS map. Again, here's that little triangle of, of um, stuff. There's our Ben and Bowie uh, Port Askeg telluride formation. This orange ornamentation is supposed to represent those dolomitic units at the bottom that we were looking at. And then here's this thing, that this major fault that separates the Lossett limestone from the Jura quartzite. And it's known on these maps, it's been called the Ben Barn Thrust, the BBT. And it's got a hanging wall uh, ornamentation on, the, on it on, the, on, the, on this side, implying that this has come up and gone over the top. The trouble is this is younger than that, and it's got younger over older. So that you think, well, what is going, what is going on with this? You know, this is not a thrust in the classic sense of like the Moyne thrust. This is some sort of weird structure. Um, in fact, in, if you look at the maps of Isla, uh, currently the current map, the, uh, the, the survey geologists map, map put this thing here and, and sort of stop the fault here. This is, the, this is where we are now. And going south, they have stopped the fault here. And then the contact between the, the lower part of the Dalradian and the uh, Jura Quartz site had, has got Port Askeg Tier out here. And it, they mapped it here, right down here, as a stratigraphic contact, only here to be a fault contact. The current map, which, is, which my map's based on, shows this thrust to snake all the way down, right down across Isla. And I think that's untenable. I think I, I, would, I would prefer this interpretation that they came up with in 1907, that this fault occurs here, this bit, but not down here. And this is actually sort of stratigraphic continuity down in this section. And you've actually got a thin Port Askeg formation, which you do get right down in the O, and, and some Port Askeg formation deposited here, and some Bonahab and Dolomite. So stratigraphy may be fairly normal, fairly steeply dipping, but normal here, but faulted out by this strange fault and this is Ben Barn here. So if it doesn't occur in Ben Barn, then it can't be called the Ben Barn Thrust. It's something we're gonna have to give, have to give it a different name. And this is the, this is the survey uh, cross section showing the Ben Barn Thrust doing this with the younger Jura Quartzite thrust on top of older, so younger over older, which is a sort of wrong way around. Normally a thrust brings older over younger. So if you sort of mess around with this thing and think about what this what is doing, this is typical thrust when you get when you get older rocks over younger, which might develop into some sort of anticline, this is pretty much what generally people think of as what Isla looks like. But you can get back thrusts, and this is a sort of an example and a pop-up. So you can get, uh, depending on the geology, when you do thrust something, you can get a, a, a forward-facing thrust and a backward-facing thrust. And a, another little picture I've, I've pulled from somewhere that does the, shows the same thing. And maybe this is part of trying to explain Isla that you've got uh, a main master fault, maybe, which is maybe the Loch Skerrill's thrust. We'll talk about that another time, being, being the main controlling forward-facing thr uh, thrust, f f with facing the, going in the direction of the, of the tectonic transport, the thrusting up this way, but a back thrust doing this. And it may be there you can get, you can get your, your older over younger uh, proper proper geology going, uh, but the thrust instead of going that way is going this way into the, into the structure, and you get this thing called a pop up. So maybe the Isla anticline is some sort of pop up feature. 
and there's me annotating the 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 section uh with the thrust not doing that but doing this and this is maybe uh showing the there's the lock scarrel's thrust so maybe the whole thing has just sort of squeezed and squashed and we've got this the whole of the inner anticline has just gone up as a pop-up and maybe what we're looking at is the is the sort of the uh, the inversion of a of a major sort of half grab and, and maybe the controlling fault this lock scarrel's thrust the balsa fault um was the bounding fault of a of a, of a half grab and deeper center that's been pushed back so it originally was extensional it went down accommodated all the sediment when it was at 650 million years ago and then later on in the in the uh, or, uh, Caledonia orogeny at 470 it was reversed and pushed up and maybe that the, the slock scarrel's horizontal section is a shortcut thrust in the footwall here with a back thrust in here somewhere and this explains the thin dura quartz site and the stratigraphy down in the south of Isla because it's on the top of the fault block whereas we're in this part of the section, we're in this bit here with the Dura Quartzite on the Bonnarvon Dolomite on the Port Askig Tillite. So I'm beginning to get some sort of feeling for what's going on geologically with this. And it's just a good example of the, uh, we've, we've walked across this thrust on the coast and it was nice to have a think about what was, Earth was going on. So leaving structural geology behind, and I, anyone who's a structural geologist, please talk to me because I'm not, and I've just made all this up. And it just, it's just my observations over years and years of walking that, trying to understand it. So we start walking up towards Amial, and we do find this strange outcrop here. And I looked at this for a long time and realized it's actually great big blocks. This is just like blocks could be, this could be equivalent to the Great Breccia um, on the Gravelux, but we don't see blocks as big as this at Ben and Bowie. So it's, uh, we're only five, three miles away, two, three kilometers away. And yet we've got a, a, a uh, we've got great big blocks of, of this is a great vertical block. Some of these blocks are several meters big, uh, uh, sitting upside down, uh, uh, twisted, all sorts of. This is and this sort of topography geology is what you see on the Garvelix at the Great Breccia. So it's uh, it's it's here, um, but it's it's the only example I know on Isla that's a bit like this. Um, further north, again, you start to get Port Askeg formation with granite with granite boulders in it which is what everyone kind of expects to see in the Port Askeg formation, sort of a, uh, granite, big granite pieces. There's not just Port Askeg tillite, not just tillites, there's some sort of cleave siltstones and uh, metasandstones up this section here, and it's quite faulted. Yeah? And here is a good example of, of, of a class, some class in here that are running this direction with a definitely a foliation running this way because this is bedding. You can see bedding in this thing here. Bedding is going this way. In fact, some of these class must be running parallel to bedding, but it's definitely cleavage this way. Yeah, and so there's this, this is, this, so if you saw that in isolation, you might think, oh, that's some sort of penetration of the bedding, but it's not. It's definitely cleavage in that direction and there's bedding, definitely bedding in this direction. And further up the coast, you suddenly find a big dolomite. And this is strange. And I was there with Tony and we had a good poke around in the cliffs, in the bushes and things. It was springtime and the vegetation was down a bit, but there's a great big dolomite unit up here. And when we dug down in here, we found dolomite sitting with a tillite on top of it. Yeah. So we thought, is this the, is this the Lossett limestone? And, and all of our uh, dolomitic, um, basal dolomitic and breaches is missing and we've got Poaskeg formation diamictites because there's a class, there's some class here. This is beautiful diamictites in these sections here, sitting above a limestone. What's happened to the stratigraphy? It's gone mad again. So having got some breaches that we never saw before, we've now got an unconformity here between diamictite and dolomite. Now it could be that this is one of the dolomites within the section, like the upper dolomite, and you see it just here again. There's a fault through a dike here, and then as you see it again here. Yeah. And this is the Amial uh, Peninsula that we're going to have struggled to get round. But again, we've got diamic types of granite class in it sitting on a sitting on a dolomite here. This is the hard bit to get round. I have been through here, except I was wearing a peaked cap and bashed my head here and nearly knocked myself out. So from then onwards, I've been wearing a hard hat and being very careful around here. Uh, but you can get around here with care at a very low tide, but I wouldn't recommend it. And I'm not putting it in any book. You should do this. So normally you would stop here and go back. But we're going to nip round because that's what we can do today and go around to the other side. So this is uh, around the other side. Again, got some quite good strong cleavage in the in the diamictites here. So we're now off piste completely. We've sort of lost, uh, we're off the maps I've made. 
and we're, and we're going up the coast um, to Fionnefort, um, which is a favorite locality of Alistair's, and he brings a lot of his students there. And this is one of the hazards of geologizing on, on Isla, that you uh, meet lots of Swedish geologists. I think this was at the climate change conference at Alistair, so there was actually a, quite a lot of people. But this is, this is field work. This is extreme field work. Alistair deserved a drink at the end of this, taking this lot uh, over through the bogs and the, of, uh, of uh, the Dunlosset estate. And, but he brings them here because the, because it, it, the Fiona Fort Bay is beautifully waved, wave washed and you do see some lovely, uh, nice clean sort of stuff covered in lichen and horrible seaweed and stuff. You actually see some nice, uh, some of these rounded granite pebbles sticking out of the tillite here. Um, and it's just nice, it's a lovely place to go and it's well worth a trip to go and see these things at Fiona Fort. Um, again, you get this, uh, you get these large granite boulders with this foliation. And when you take people here who've never seen some of those earlier outcrops, they look at that and they think, "Ooh, look, I found the drop stone. I've seen this wrapping around bedding here, but this, take my word, this is not bedding. This is, this is metamorphic foliation wrapping around a, 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 a clast here. Um, further north, just we, we do we, further north we do see um some conglomerates um whether these are debris flows sort of slumping of slurry of or uh some sort of feature here uh, that's caused all this boulder field and here's the here's the here's the cleave diamictite here with some stones in it and you get this great big thing is there's obviously a someone's going to tell me something about this Matthew said it is a channel. It's quite possible it's a channel. It's quite possible that's that's a, that's 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 channelized. When you look at it from a different angle, yeah, you see that the cleavage in the tillite, yeah, is going up through into the into the, the muds of the of this channel uh, or this this debris. If it's a debris flow of some description, uh, uh, or some sort of melt phase of in glaciation, periglacial thing. Um, it could even be a wind lag. I don't know. There's Tony's done lots of got lots of people looking at these sorts of conglomerates within the uh, Poaskeg formation. My point is that the cleavage goes through it, and so if whatever this could be a horizontal bed, or it could be an inclined bed. It could be the edge of a channel. Never that's the whatever that is. That is original sedimentary. This is metamorphic, and these stones are, 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 are sitting in the cleavage, not in a bedding. Someone else who wants to say something. Okay, so it's it's twenty to eight. I'm moving on quickly. I'm nearly finished actually. Um, so further, just the. Just a bit further north, we see this little area here, and I'm just going to jump into some archaeology um, because there's a terrace here that's quite interesting. Um, because sometimes you find archaeologists camped on it, and there's a camp and a big tent. Uh, there's the ferry, and this is Ruba Potanjselik, which has got a Mesolithic campfire in it. It's been excavated by Stephen Mython, and some of the layers here have got. Uh, Mesolithic artifacts in it, uh, dated around about 8,000 years ago. But they found this little layer at the bottom here, which they found some very, very rare, very unusual pointed uh, flint artifacts. And these are almost certainly very late glacial. So these are probably 10 to 12,000 years old at the end of the Younger Dryas. So the Younger Dryas was that rapid cooling phase that happened at the end, after the last glaciation. So I, at, the t at the peak of it, Isla was pretty inhospitable with frozen seas and a lot, of, a lot of tundra. But as that started to ameliorate, we'd probably find hunter-gatherers moving north, chasing reindeer and that sort of thing. And so that this was probably a hunting camp. Uh, and this is probably some of the oldest datable uh, proper uh, evidence of human habitation after the ice in Scotland. And this is a, so it's a prime site. And Stephen's very keen to get back here again and do some more excavations of all this stuff here. Um, he thinks the, this is Stephen. If you want to read more of his books, that's a beautiful uh, pop sci uh, archaeology book, very really readable of Stephen's career as an archaeologist on the islands of Scotland. This is a again you get sort of the internet. This is the sort of excavation report. There's sort of uh, there's other there's more technical reports than that as well. He believes these Arensbergian people crossed Doggerland and came round uh, as the ice was melting. They were chasing reindeer around Scotland. 
Um, so there's presumably more camps all over the place, but this is just one where we found. And the reason it was found was the Dunlosset estate uh, head gamekeeper, they did an experiment with uh, pigs and they put wild pigs out here to snuffle up stuff. And it was the pigs that unearthed the Mesolithic flint implements. It was DJ McPhee, who's a well, well Kent figure on Isla took uh, all his, uh, took the samples to Stephen and it, it was then, so Stephen then took this, it was the pigs that found it with DJ. Then we walk back to Bally Grant past the Lily Lock, which is really beautiful um, and lovely in the springtime when the lilies start to come out. So we've got a four kilometre walk all the way back to Bally Grant. Did I mention there was a book? Yes. Um, so these two excursions are going to be in the new book, not the old book. The old book, I didn't put them in. I just talked a bit some stuff up there, but the new book is going to have these in as well as six on Jura and some on Colonsey. I'm doing a wee talk on Colonsey, a little talk for Angus on geowalks on Tuesday at 6.30. So tune into Geowalks, uh, Angus's Geowalks uh, site on Tuesday night. If you want to hear a little bit about Collinsy, I'm going to do a little sort of tour of Collinsy on Tuesday night. So uh, yeah, the new book was supposed to be launched this spring, this summer, but it'll be spring next year before you'll need to do more testing, field testing. And it's, uh, that's obviously not happening at the moment. As you know, uh, often in my all my walks, they finish with a whiskey recommendation in the, in the, in the, in the traditional Isla style. Um, this time we're going to the Bally Grant Inn, which was the, uh, the house of the manager of the Robles lead mine originally. Um, lots of whiskies in it. And there's a beautiful mural on the wall here. Um, the guy, Sean O'Leary, has unfortunately died, um, painted it and it was characters in the bar, but you can see here the, uh, the grim, uh, minister here drinking his tea next to this topless lady here with his uh, glass of whiskey under the counter. So it's a beautiful mural. And if you've ever been here, it's worth going to see the mural and having a, having a dram. And um, there's also, he's done a lovely mural in the Beaumont Hotel and there's one in Jura as well. So um, well worth a, a visit. And you can take your choice of all the Isla whiskies here tonight. Someone did ask me what whiskey was it going to be tonight? And I, and I, so you can either have a Lossit, Lost Distillery or your choice from this fantastic selection. The, the, this is a, one of the Whiskey Bars of the Year Award many times, and it has the father and son are experts in whiskey. So I think that was it, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll unmute, no, anyone who wants to say anything, just unmute yourself. Yeah, if I unmute everybody, it'll be a, a cacophony of noise, but uh, we have a bit of an aim to finish so we could actually go out and do our last, uh, 10th Thursday night clap at, at, at five to eight. So we have a little bit of time if anyone wants to, to, to raise any questions or say anything, yeah? I'm gonna have a drink. So I've got here, I know Alistair's probably got a drink there, but I've got a bottle of 10 year old Port Charlotte from Brook Laddie. So I'm gonna have one of these now. I think my voice needs it anyway. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, David. Matthew, uh, Matthew, you asked a question. Somebody asked a question. Um, where was the chat? So I'm just reading out some of the um, some of the questions here. Uh, Patrick Casey, who's a PhD um, student of Alistair's, I believe, doing a work on doing work on the monazite. Uh, Xenotime, like monazite, is a rare earth element, phosphate mineral. Monazite is a cerium phosphate. Xenotime is a Y-phosphate, both of which contain high amounts of uranium thorium. So, uh, yes, so um, Patrick, I await your results with interest as to how will you get anything out of that at all, yeah? Matthew talks about the cast infill due to sea level fall rate to the onset of glaciation. Well, certainly that cast could well have been formed at at something like snowball earth time it's certainly there's a lot of erosion going on a lot of uh, it, uh so it's quite possible that what you're seeing remember all the deposits we see are, are when things are melting yeah De tills are deposited when glaciers move you get quartzites when it's melted uh these fluvial rocks are certainly when it's melted so there's certainly sea well sea level falls and water are about to get all these deposits Patrick thinks that the monazite may have been formed in the Caledonian orogeny. Matthew said, we talked about Matthew's channel. Um, 
Oh, sorry, Alistair says it's not a student of his, he's a student of Ian Fairchild's. Patrick, is that right? That must be, yeah. Oh, Ian Pitcairn, not Ian Fairchild. <laughs> sorry, too many Ians. Tony in Norway, do you want to say anything? Uh, yes, it's fascinating. Again, I particularly like to hear about the history of the lead mining. I didn't, I really didn't know much of what you said, the, the smithy and the tonnages and the, even a photograph of a silver cup from, from Isla. And these were quite large. Interesting enough, on William Smith's 1815 map, Isla is, the Isla has some geology marked on it. Smith never went there. So even in 1815, somebody like Smith knew about Isla, presumably because of the mining. Yes, obviously there was, um, the, the, obviously there were mining engineers went there, mainly from Wales. There's lots of Griffiths and Evanses on Isla that are derived from the, the migration of lead miners into Isla. And the, in, the, in the sort of late in the sort of early 19th century, there was a lot of investment. The Mulrish mines were drained with Cornish uh, pumping engines that must have so much Cornish people must have come to get the engines working. And some of the mines went down 100 meters and more, you know, uh, Mulrish. So they were certainly, uh, they were following the veins. They just, it wasn't, it's not a big, it's not a mass sort of sulfide deposit. It's just, it's just sort of quartz and calcite veins with, uh, with galena in it. But I think some of the, Galena is quite rich in, in there's a lot of the ratio of Galena to, to the gang minerals is quite high. So it's, uh, it was quite uh, profitable, but it was small veins. So it was, it was done by sort of hand following the veins. Um, and they must have been fighting the water all the time. Cause if you just, these mines now are full to the surface. So there must've been water everywhere. Grim life. Uh, then can I ask you uh, to say something about your Rodinia map? How, how difficult was it to make it? Um, how much did you learn? I learned a lot. But there's a lot of lot of literature, yeah, and the, and it, some of it's as you know conflicting as to what the geography was like. Was the Earth actually there's a there's a tilt theory, isn't that the Earth was actually tilted at a different angle? So that so that but and some people don't believe the low latitude Rodinia model. So reading the literature is damn hard to try and come up with consensus. But that seemed to be. To me, it makes a bit of sense that, that Rodinia did exist as a sort of mid-latitudinal, and why not? And then maybe that's some of the reason why we're getting a very unusual bit of um, climate, is that we've got an unusual geographical configuration. And then on top right. of that, you throw the flip, the, the, the Franklin Large Igneous Province, do a huge amount of geochemical weathering of, uh, of basalt, and uh, to draw down all that CO2 and get, get big cooling event. So, uh, you know. It kind of makes sense can to me, you, but it could be, could be rubbish. Can you show it again and just point to where is Isla on that map? Right, okay, I'm going to have to share my screen again. And uh, uh, let me find the slide that Tony was... Um, Didn't find it. Hang on, let me just do it again. Oh, there we are. Uh, let me just. Can you see that slide? Yes. All right. Okay. I'll just. Uh... So, I put I put Isla here. Okay. Uh, where's it? Where it says S is Scotland. That's Greenland. This is. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this 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 sort of um, embayment in the uh, here the, uh, that people talk about as that would have been the proto rift or the early rifting of Rodinia that eventually became the Apatis as, as Amazonia and Baltic and moved away from Laurentia. So this became, this is the sort of rift setting for the Dalradian, yeah, the, and the passive margin then developed as Baltic and, and Amazonia moved away and the Apatis formed in here. Does that make sense? In about twenty degrees south. I think that's probably where most people think the Port Askeg was, yeah? Then a detailed question. When you made, when you did this work to draw that map, 
did you get the impression that Scotland was inside Rodinia or is it on the continental margin of Rodinia? Well, it's close to the margin. It's not, in, it's not entirely in the centre of the continent. But uh, I mean, this is, I, I've drawn this uh, sort of uh, cratons and sort of shallow seas. Yeah, so it's on the edge of the craton and the, and the, uh, and the, and the shallow seas that sort of, you know, would have changed. So sometimes that was all land depending on the sea level. I mean, it's, who knows? I mean, it's just, that's why the, 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 the uh, I think that the, the ornamentation is that the darker blue is a sort of oceanic crust and the, uh, yeah. and the light blue is, is drowned continental shelves and, uh, uh, you know, shallow seas. And then the, the, the browns are the sort of cratons, the high, light, high ground, but. As you say, we're talking quite a long time ago, and it's sort of. Uh, but I mean, some of the work that people like Lee and and uh, and Co have done, Cox and Torsvik. I mean, some of the work it does hold together. But as you say you suddenly get a paper that throws it all about and talks about this and that, and China wasn't here, and China was over there, and you know, India wasn't there, and oh, it's sort of yeah, <laughs> good fun. Matthew says 30 degrees south. That's probably, that's, yeah, that's probably where I've drawn it, yeah? What have I got here? That's uh, 30, yeah? Zero, 30, 60, and then the pole. So this is 30 south. So yeah, I'm talking about Scotland being sort of 30 south, yeah? Oop. Okay, does that sort of kind of make sense? It's important whether our thousand meter thick tillite is on a continental margin or inside a continent. Well, we're certainly getting rifting. We certainly that model I had with the, with the faults. I mean, you've got a fault scar, a fault that, that is accommodating five kilometers of um, Dura quartzite not soon, not long after the Port Askeg formation. So things are things are moving. You've got it, you're getting accommodation space. I mean, the, 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 the sort of substance rate and the deposition rate must have been very high, yeah, at that time. You've got, to, you've got to preserve all that sediment and you've got just, I mean, there's a fault that is, maybe is the balsa fault that's accommodating five kilometers of, uh, well, five kilometers now. So it would have been six kilometers or more of, uh, of unconsolidated sediment. It's a huge, I mean, those, these things were, it was a very, very active margin. Hmm. Dave, Tony, doesn't the sedimentology tell us that much of it was on land? I mean, we have permafrost features, we've got stromatolite, so it's really shallow. So doesn't that sort of pit it down so that we're, uh, it was on land? Yeah, it was on, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, to Tony will, Talk, but, but uh, yeah, to me they're grounded it's, ice, and it, yeah, yeah, it, it's um, uh, deposition is one thing, but a sort of a paleotectonic uh, setting is is really quite important because um, if we're inside a continent, the subsidence is quite remarkable. If we're inside a continent, there is no analog today for the subsidence. Mm -hmm. Well, we're getting it, we are in a rift setting, so we will have active rifting. So we have got obviously a hole being filled with sediment. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But, but where is such a place today? People look at Baja California, but I don't think it has the same amount of uh, sedimentation. No, no, you, then you, you're next to an ocean. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we shall ponder on this for a long time. I, it was super again. I, I really sit, sit, sat here and been thoroughly entertained and I've got to send you some more. You've got some really nice photographs which I think should end up in our memoir, frankly. Well, I've been around those outcrops a few times with different, in different lighting and that's, yeah. the, that's the context. Sometimes you go there and it's dreek and drizzly and the photographs are rubbish and other times the sun's in the right place and just picks out features yeah. in I the mean, rocks. And, just, just so they hear this, I mean, you have shown the outcrop photograph of a stratomatolite 
in the Isle of Limestone, which I drew a sketch of in my memoir, Fig 42B, mm -hmm. 50 years ago. I mean, yes. I wouldn't be able to find it today, but you, you've just shown me a photograph of it tonight. Well, Alistair takes all those Swedish, all those Swedish geologists that Alistair takes, they all go up there and put their fingers on it and take pictures of it. It's famous. Um, it's famous. I'm ask you where that is, definitely. Thank you very much, David. Okay, right. Any more questions? I'm going to close down now so that everyone can go out and do their clapping and we can have another drink. So. Thank you, Dave. That was brilliant. Okay. So Sorry, maybe, just maybe see some of John Collins on Tuesday night, yeah? Thank you. Well, Thanks very I'm much. But I'm taking Thanks a break. So, I'm taking a break from virtual trips for a while. I've done my head in. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dave. It's been brilliant. Okay. All the best. Bye. Thanks very much. Cheers.